Thanks so much, everyone, for joining today's uh, session on Next Level Network Automation for the Power Grid. I'm Jeffrey Tufts. Uh, I lead utility solutions globally for Cisco. And so let's go ahead and, uh, and kick it off and, and get started. So today, uh, joining me today, we have uh, two really great guests, guests that are going to uh, help us uh, tell the story about where network automation is and where it's going within the utility space. So um, really pleased to welcome in Marcus Smith to the conversation, um, a chartered engineer from Cisco that leads up our utilities and renewables uh, solutioning and validated designs, uh, and then uh, Dan Baeth, uh, professional engineer from Burns and McDonald. Uh, between the three of us, we have close to probably 75 years of, of experience in OT networks, uh, predominantly in the, the energy space. So that's who we are today, and uh, I'll say it. I'll say it at least once more. Uh, and thanks again for, for Marcus and Dan for joining us today to really help us uh, dive into the topic. So with that, <clears throat> excuse me, with that, let's, uh, let's move on. So uh, what we'll look at today here is we're just going to open up with a baseline of network automation. What is it? Uh, where was it born from? What are some of the benefits and, and so on? Just to give everyone uh, sort of a base level of, of, uh, of understanding of network automation. Then we're going to dive into a conversation with Dan around network automation, specifically in the energy operations or OT space. We'll close out with, uh, with Marcus on uh, the validated design work that his team is doing in the labs, specifically around uh, OT network automation. So that's what we're up for today. And uh, with that being said, let's dive right in. So uh, digital transformation, the digitization, digitization of energy, uh, all of these things go by uh, uh, a number of different names. But, um, you know, we started this, this process of, of digitizing things in the energy space almost 15 years ago. And it is, it is sort of progressed at a, a pretty uh, consistent slope, if you will, probably until the last several years. And you can see some of the, the drivers that we called out here. Uh, certainly from an enterprise side, uh, think uh, people working from home, uh, moving workloads to the cloud, those types of things. Certainly COVID expedited things on the enterprise side. But specific into the operations space, we've seen the sustainability uh, and DER uh, investment and deployments create a, a, a fairly significant um, uh, disruption in the distribution grid going from one-way power flow to two-way power flow and and all of the state and telemetry that's required to keep the, uh, the distribution grid in, in balance certainly has driv driven a, a good bit of digital transformation, distribution automation, and all the, the benefits that come with that, whether it's efficiency or improved reliability of the grid, certainly have driven a, a number of digital uh, initiatives out in the grid. And, and of course, politics, geopolitical, if we're looking at things, for example, in, in Europe, when it comes to being able to quickly um, quickly change where our source of, of, uh, of energy is coming from and moving, moving energy around a little bit differently on the transmission side than uh, perhaps was done uh, a year and a half ago with what's going on in Ukraine. So that being said is, is in the same way we saw, uh, I suppose, a, a digital transformation on the uh, IT side over the many years, we're seeing it and continue to see it in the slope of that graph, the, the ramp of adoption is, is, is accelerating. Uh, for the reasons I mentioned, but the other piece of it is, uh, of course, uh, I suppose this, co uh, this intersects with politics, is there's a lot of funding that is uh, taking, taking projects that might have taken 10 years and accelerating them to, to five or seven. And so that's adding a little bit of fuel to the fire as well. So lots happening, lots, lots changing, but underlying it in, in sort of the uh, foundation of today's uh, today's topic is that there is a lot of digital assets being deployed or, or previously unconnected assets uh, being connected to, uh, to get telemetry or to be, be able to provide automation and, and so on, as I mentioned. So <clears throat> with that sort of foundation in place, let's move on to another. So what is generally network automation, right? So we're, we're looking to automate really the whole life cycle of, of the network. So as you can see here, we pull out a couple things, whether it's configuring, testing, deploying, and, and operations of, of both the physical and the, the virtual components of the network. And so really it's taking what was historically 
uh, a pretty human intensive uh, operation and, and moving it into uh, some sort of orchestration, a uh, level of automation, just taking those human tasks. So at the base level, level, taking some human tasks and automating them. And then as we go higher up that value stack, taking some disassociated components and adding them together, which would be orchestration, right? With business rules. Uh, for example, I want to add an IED. We then push out all the different IT aspects, whether it's turning up a substation switch, uh, putting an entry into your distribution management service and, and so on. So, so that's generally speaking network automation. And, and so, you know, where is its genesis? How did it come to be? If we look back, um, you know, probably just as, as recently as five years ago, about 95% of network changes were performed manually. And so this really had, had two challenges, right? So certainly I, I call out I call it the first one here is that the operational cost. So for a, for a significant network, we can look at just operating the network could be two to three times higher than the actual cost of the network. And so, you know, that's a, that's a keen intersection with utilities, right? So our, in, in the energy market, our core line of business is not operating networks, right? It's, it's providing power. And so when we have an asset that, that costs several times more to actually just operate it, that isn't our core line of business, that tends to tend to rise up, and we, we tend to see that as an opportunity to to uh, to do something about it. The other piece of it is, if you think about the networks that we're building in the OT space, right? So they are they are the foundational component to the digital use cases we're putting out there. Whether it's fault location and isolation, um, teleprotection, uh, voltage optimization, and so forth, those things are enabled by the underlying network. And so the reliability of that network starts to become correlated, or I should say the reliability of those, those use cases in the underlying grid starts to become correlated to the, to the actual OT network that is supporting it. And so we call out here you know, a stat that is, uh, has been around for, for decades, my whole career, is that human error is, is by far the leading number one cause of network outages. And so the intersection that we see between well, geez, it, it costs quite a bit of money to operate a network. Uh, and the, if we're doing that through human labor, that's also likely the cause of our, our number one network of outages. So that, those, two, those two pieces on the IT side really came true and were um, brought forward by the vendor community to, to, to address those and, and then was born and has, has been significantly adopted on the IT side of, of network automation and then, as I alluded to, some, some network orchestration and so forth. So that's how we've, we've gotten here, that's how the vendor community got here, and that's largely how IT has, uh, has arrived here as well. And so uh, just to take a look at, at, you know, certainly automation, as you can imagine, um, you know, if we go back to the, the some of the first components of automation, I, we can think of, say, for example, Henry Ford and, and what they did with, uh, uh, with automation and creating the, the Model T, right? And so speed was a big component of it. And so we'll call out speed, but with automation, it's probably better to say it's speed with accuracy. And that's really a, um, the combination that we find most compelling, or at least you know, the customers that I talk to find most compelling is, is the combination of being able to have that the speed and velocity to do certain things that the business is asking us to do on the OT network, but doing it with the accuracy and the reliability that is warranted in the OT environment. So, um, you know, really what we want to do is, is OT, uh, as suppliers and partners in the OT networking domain, is we want to be enablers and not hindrance. And what I mean by that with respect to speed is if we're trying to roll out a uh, a particular automation scheme on a, a troublesome distribution feeder, we don't want to be, the OT network certainly does not want to be the, the, the component of that project that slows down the time to value of that use case, whether it's Blizzard or whatever the case may be. So there is certainly a speed component, but it, um, it's not without saying that, that speed with accuracy is an area that we need to really focus on. So the other piece that we'll, we'll call out here and one of the underpinnings of the value that we can see with, with automation in the OT environment is, is that certainly as things become more complex, they slow things down. The other piece of complexity is 
if we layer in that human element, is going to be with complexity comes errors, right? And so that's why we've always had the keep it simple mantra and, and so forth. But um, there's a lot of things that we can't keep simple anymore, right? So I call out the first one in the top left here, which is security. So particularly in the bulk electric system, let's say on the trans transmission side or in some of the generation, larger generation facilities and so forth, you know, not only are we being asked to do things more secure from a regulatory standpoint, we, we are being told that we need to do them internally simply from a risk and um, a business continuity standpoint. And so those, sec those security postures are becoming more and more uh, sophisticated and complex. Uh, we're, we're leaving the days of, you know, this is, this is just about uh, security boundaries, think VLANs, uh, rudimentary firewalls, and so forth, and we're needing to get much more complex in depth. Think uh, security visibility, micro-segmentation, uh, deep packet inspection, those types of things, right? And so that posture is really driving, uh, from a lower level, a, a much more significant configuration. And so that's just one example of how things are getting more complex um, and we need, to, we need to be able to ensure that we have accuracy in terms of that security policy. And so you can start to see the groundwork of why automation, particularly when security is being layered in and, and um, that security is becoming more complex than some of the bulk electric sites. But uh, I call it a couple, couple items here as well. So network migration, we're certainly moving you know, there's no shortage of networks that are moving from legacy, whether it's SDH, PDH, Sonnet to packet, whether it's uh, 3G to 4G, uh, public 4G into private 4G, 5G on the field area network. But there is um, uh, even new networks, as I alluded to, on the, on the move to private networks, there's a migration component. And so that migration component is also a nice target for, for network automation is that's... Um, largely what the service providers uh, leverage in the network automation stack is, is for network migration and adding of uh, capacity and so forth. So uh, there's a whole other, uh, uh, pardon me, there's a number of other items here, certainly network upgrades. I think Dan and Marcus will talk about that and the value of, of automation. Uh, but nevertheless, um, it goes, it continues the trend of, of, of speed, accuracy, and being able to accommodate whatever complexity is, is moving forward in the OT space. So we, we talked about speed and we wouldn't think, you know, in the OT environment, speed is, is not necessarily our number one driver, and, and that is the case, um, with some exceptions that we'll talk about. But what that gives us uh, is the ability to actually do things at some pace but really underscore this component, and that's with repeatable quality. Quality having a correspondence to um, uh, accuracy, which of course correlates to, to reliability. And so that's really one of the underpinnings of, of where OT um, networks, their associated managers and architects are, are sort of really giving um, this, this notion of automation um, you know, it, it's, it's light of day, it's opportunity and so forth. The other piece of automation is once, once you have this sort of centralized view of your network, which is in part the architecture of automation is having sort of a centralized view of it and being able to push that central, centralized view out into the corresponding nodes, network elements, uh, platforms, software, and so forth, is that centralized view can create a bit of a digital twin. And so we'll talk a little bit about that notion of a digital twin for the OT network and some of the benefits that that has when we, uh, when we dive into the discussion with, uh, with Dan uh, shortly. The other piece that I'll, I'll call here is, you know, if, if an IT organization and a corresponding utility is, is using some level of network automation, we start to see a marriage between what IT is doing uh, in terms of rolling out monitoring managing, planning for changes, planning for upgrades, planning for moves and ads and so forth, we start to see some sort of, um, uh, I suppose, efficiencies of scale of process that we'll touch on as well. So just a little bit of a call out here in terms of, you know, what what is some of the things uh, sort of enumerated here? So reduce time to, to, to achieving whatever that business outcome is, uh, being able to uh, 
uh, get to the speed and autonomy of that use case and so forth. But um, if we look at those smarter decisions and so forth, that really starts to, to pull in the notion of a digital twin, um, being able to troubleshoot things offline in that digital twin, as well as predict how things are going to change um, offline before you make that change. It really drives um, some, um, some operational excellence to avoid some uh, unfortunate fortunate outages that we've seen. And so finally, uh, you know, if we're looking on, you know, what this notion of, of modernized operations is, the, the part that I would pull out here really is trustworthy, right? And so it, it pulls out or pulls from the notion that I've already established, which is if we, if we have a certain security posture, if we have a certain firmware, whatever the case may be, we want that level of automation to be able to keep track that we have a system that's as trustworthy as we hope it, hope it is. Uh, and intended it to uh, and intended it to be. And so uh, finally, you know, we're looking at the, the visibility from an automation standpoint, again, being able to have that centralized view, have the insights and, and do the actions that, uh, that we've already talked about. So if we, if we take just a simple high look, high value, or sorry, high, high level view of, of utility network automation benefits, you know, there's a whole host of, of day zero, uh, leading up to deployment, sort of day of, cut over, and then, you know, operational moving forward um, that we'll talk, touch base with Dan on, whether it's uh, this notion of zero touch deployments or a life cycle across the board. So these tend to be some of the principal things that are uh, the early adopters are looking at to, to leverage from an OT environment. So with that, I want, I'm going to pull Dan into the conversation. Um, as I alluded to earlier, you know, uh, Dan's been at this for, for some time. I think Dan and I have worked together for almost 15 years and uh, partnered, partnered deeply with Burns and McDonald over the years. They have just a fantastic intersection of uh, operational experience in the energy space, building out substations, transmission lines, as well as Dan's group that builds the OT networks. And so uh, really pleased to welcome you, Dan, today. And if uh, you wouldn't mind jump in, tell the audience if they're not familiar with Burns and Mac, just give them a little bit of a, a brief overview and then we'll dive into our chat. Yeah, yeah. Um, so real real quick view, uh, Burns and McDonald it just started our 125th year in business, founded in 1898. Uh, we're now 13,000 plus professionals and 100% employee owned. Uh, we are a engineering construction firm and now we've we've reached kind of a global presence as we've expanded well outside of our our headquarters founded in uh, Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, we now have offices across the entire globe from India to the UK. Um, as far as our scope of projects for the, you know, Jeff mentioned, we build substations, transmission lines, generating plants, but beyond that, uh, airports, uh, hydroelectric, food and beverage processing, anything that is large infrastructure, our company gets involved in one way or another from the full design and build. And then, you know, Jeff mentioned my, my group does T&D and just about any form of mission critical communications for processing plants, uh, generating facilities, airports, as well as, you know, our core business in T&D. Uh, T&D communications wise, our, our group works from anything from consulting and business case development. And then we also have a team that is 24 seven operations for utility networks. Uh, and, and we really fill any gap in between there from the design through installation, turn up, commissioning and systems integration. So our, our team has kind of grown in scope from the old days of Utility comm used to be a, a necessary evil to get things done, and now it has become almost the the enabler for, you know, the the uh, big wide area distribution expansions, distribution modernization programs that are really going full speed today. Yeah, and I'd be hard hard pressed to look at this picture and and think of a think of a packet that would pass in support of uh, the electric grid that isn't going across some of this. It's it's not obvious to me, but I think you have pretty much everything covered with respect to digital operations of, uh, 
uh, of the grid, and I think we've worked together in, in most of those. So Dan, take us through what, what you're seeing as just general industry trends in the energy space, and then I'll come back in and we'll talk a little bit about how these how these intersect with uh, with network automation. Okay. Yeah, uh, you know, the broad category, digitization of energy, it's kind of a blanket term for how much more communication is needed to enable things like, well, the distribution modernization enabled by a distribution field area network. Those That communication is becoming absolutely critical to operation of the grid where we, you know, the we're, we're now in a world where we're getting towards a two-way power flow where rooftop solar for commercial and residential, we have electric vehicles coming home, chargers, and all of this is creating a very dynamic distribution grid, which was never designed for that. So now we have things like circulating currents and conditions in the distribution system that 10 years ago, we didn't even, maybe, maybe we thought about it in the far off future, but we're not an issue. And now we're, we're looking at, say, a distribution recloser gets deployed. It has protection settings. And you might have set that, you know, 10 years ago, you'd have set that and just forgotten about it. It'd be done. It'd be under local control. But now we have devices that need, depending on weather patterns, need settings changes or may need settings changes eight to 10 times a day. And we, we just can't reliably operate the grid the way we used to on, in the distribution system. So um, in the distribution, you know, with, those, with those use cases, Dan, what are you seeing you know, with your with your team kind of supporting utilities to build out that operational communications infrastructure, how are you seeing that impact the, the OT networking groups within utilities? Yeah, I mean, that plays right. So the transmission and fiber networks that have been built out for their, the last, you know, 20 plus years as fiber optic and sonnet and now packet networks have, have rolled out to support transmission this is the next move out from there. Those are now the backhaul network for these field area networks, whether they're, and, and really the field area network could be public cellular, uh, private cellular, 4G, 5G, but it's we're moving beyond what we used to get away with on typically narrow channels and mesh networks of kilobits per second. We need more real-time operations. So now we're, we're pulling more data and there's more demand, it, it's going to increase the demand on those transmission fiber backbone type networks as, you know, becoming the backhaul for FAN, in addition to their, all of the transmission functions they've been serving for their, you know, since they were built. And what, what sort of volume are you seeing going out into the distribution grid, and just in terms of connected devices? And do you... If there is a volume, what, what do you see as the intersection there with network automation? I mean, volume-wise, if you go take uh, the reclosers, volt bar controllers, smart fuses for utility in a single state, that could be 10,000 plus devices easily. It just depends the scope and how much control you need. It may not be needed as much in rural areas as urban, where you're going to have more customers putting taxing the grid with uh, electric vehicles and adding more solar, but you're getting into a scale of devices where you said, Hey, we have one, two, three, 500 devices or, or I'm sorry, communication, you know, transport nodes in our, in our big fiber network. Now we're looking at, let's just say it's 10,000 devices or even 5,000 devices. These are huge numbers of things to have to manage. And it, I, I feel this is going to be a big driver to automate everything that is going on in that field area network to manage that quantity of devices. Because, you know, you said, uh, you know, the O&M cost to administrate manually is two to three X or, or, you know, whatever statistic we had there. We can't, we simply can't scale that to 10, 20, 30,000 devices. And then what if your fan network becomes the AMI network as well? And now I've got a million devices on it. And j just the managing something in that scale has to be done in with automation platforms of some sort. And because the human the human hours to do it, if if you could afford the staff, you likely couldn't even staff up that many people with constraints in like skilled labor. 
Yeah, and I think, you know, with, with sort of interpreting what you're saying, part of, you know, automation, orchestration, all of this has a lot of uh, components to what it means, but specific to the fan, I think what you're driving at here is, is how do we get these things deployed, right? Um, mm -hmm. And how do we do it? How do we do it accurately? And how do we do it in, in mass? Seems to be the aspect of automation that intersects with the fan. Does that seem to characterize that correctly? Yeah, if I, if I need to, you know, as part of a project, we're going to get all, let's just target kind of an easy to discuss uh, asset. Like, let's look at reclosers. Hey, we need to do this. We need better distribution automation schemes. I need smarter reclosers with communication. And my field assets are aging. And as part of this program, I'm going to go replace those. I, I will need a qualified electrical worker, a line worker, somebody who's going to go install that cabinet and get it connected to the recloser. And if I have to have a separate person come by to provision just the communication device, even on-site, off-site, wherever, I'm just doubling up on labor. So that, de that deployment is just the beginning of where I need less human touches on everything. I need, you know, that the touch to the modem needs to be to place it in the cabinet. The provisioning side should happen as it comes on the air and it's identified as, hey, this is the recloser modem in this cabinet. Here's your settings. You're off and running. Because I have a different worker out there who's skilled in installing it and qualified to install it versus the skilled person who could sit down and manually program it. And I'm just doubling up labor. And I, I need that. I need all of those steps to happen automatically after I've defined here are the security policies, here are the settings, here's the whatever security tunnels or anything else that needs to be provisioned on that communications device. That needs to be automatic when it's powered up by the person doing the install for that cabinet. And so, you know, to your point of, we just need to reduce human touches on all of this because as we scale up the number of devices and the speed they're going, they're, they're being installed, we. We can't double and triple up on the number of people doing it like we probably did when I said, you know, I have 15 uh, reclosers on an MAS radio. Okay, well, 15, that, that's totally doable. We're not, we're probably not going to save a whole time, a lot of time automating a whole lot of this. And, and one of the hindrances to automation has been older equipment in the electric, you know, grid communication system. There's just that, you know, Utilities like to put stuff out there and, and run it for for as many years as they can get out of it because it is disruptive to do these upgrades. And some of those legacy devices are not things that are easy to automate. They just weren't designed for it. You don't have API access into things, or you might not even have a central manager management platform. You just have discrete devices in the field because, hey, when this is installed 15, 20 years ago, this is the device we used, and it worked really well to get a little bit of information out of the device every so often. So yeah. uh, we have this, you know, when, when, this big shift. The things, oh, my apologies, Dan. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, no, one of the things you touched on in terms of the, uh, the evolution of, of the field area network, and uh, let me just take a step back, just notionally. So the field area network is loosely, uh, you know, the network that would cover a uh, service territory. Oftentimes it's a radio type network, but could be, uh, a mix of radio and, and fiber, for example, an LTE network built over a, a service territory might be considered a, a field area network. So his, you know, there were the early days, as you alluded to, that there could be these mesh networks that um, that were leveraged <clears throat> for for some of this telemetry and so forth. And I think we've we've seen a move towards towards uh, you know moving to LTE, even private LTE, and, and so forth. One of the things that struck me when you said that is. Um, you know, some of those mesh networks, they were uh, considered lossy, right? So some of the protocols uh, were considered lossy and, and, you know, we've improved, generally speaking, throughputs, um, but as some of these distribution screen schemes are, are pushed out, not only do they require perhaps some more bandwidth, but they require a network that's a higher reliability than some of the traditional lossy networks, you know, that have significant amount of retransmissions and so forth. So as these use cases require more reliability, I think that sort of ties back into the automation piece, of course, when, when you're touching 20, 30, 40,000 endpoints, 1% um, error 
Um, seems a, like a, a, a number we could pull out of the, the air that perhaps people wouldn't, uh, wouldn't balk at. And uh, not only is that a whole lot of truck rolls, but that's a whole lot of assets that would be down during deployment and, and rollout and, uh, and so forth. So what are you seeing on, on the transmission side? We're, we're, let's dive into the substation here. What's, what are you seeing changing in the, in the substation world? Um, and then we'll bring it back to, to automation and what you think, uh, what, what's Burns view on, Burns and Max view on, on automation and the transmission side? Yeah. Um, so on the on the transmission side, a lot of and I, again, I'm, I, I'll speak in averages. Obviously, I can't speak case by case for every every single client we work with. But on averages, a lot of automation we're seeing in the transmission space is based around O and M reduction. But it a lot of it's driven by using the same staff to do the same to do more tasks. As those networks expand, I have more things to manage. I have more things to check, more things to configure, more things to audit as for compliance or, you know, external compliance reasons or even internal auditors within the, the company itself. And those repeatable tasks cost money and time. And if, if, st if staffing up operations is either restricted by budget reasons or just lack of skilled labor to hire, the same people are doing more tasks and how do we how do we take some off my plate day to day well the the low hanging fruit is repeatable tasks out of those either you know through scripting or things like first party tools network management systems with built in capabilities for this starting to more leverage or fully leverage those capabilities so that i am not a human doing a thing that is easy enough Maybe not network changes, but how am I pulling the information and possibly aggregating alarms in a single place or correlating alarms? But how do I simplify the operational views and, and information gathering in the network? That's a very big area that I, I, I've seen in common because it's seen as less risky. And I know, you know, I, I don't, I definitely don't disagree that human error is something we have to eliminate and kind of the thought of, if I do it myself, I won't, you know, I know exactly what's happening. And if I'm just pulling information, let's automate all that. There's, there's little risk there, but at the same time, if I automate something that changes something on a lot of places, there is the thought and, and it's not impossible that I caught us a lot of widespread damage very quickly. So in the transmission space, um, which is a fairly static environment, uh, you know, a, a new transmission substation doesn't pop up out of the blue. Those are well planned ahead. Uh, those are easy to coordinate and they're not happening in rapid fire. Uh, activities on the substation land also fairly static. So those can be planned. And I think there's been less push to automate things like provisioning as much uh, across the board because it is a periodic task. It is not something you know, as we were talking about the distribution fan and the speed of deployment, the transmission system is, is a very land and, you know, construction takes a lot of time. Projects that drive changes in the substation land take time. So there's time to plan and implement. And it just seems less of a target for automation than, you know, the distribution side, which is going to, which is moving at a very rapid pace. Yeah, I, I think I would agree with respect to, you know, if we look at, at automation from a speed standpoint, the fan, the velocity at which things are being put out in the fan far exceeds anything we would, we've ever seen, you know, uh, on the transmission side. I think an intersection for uh, bulk electric transmission substations and so forth, right? So if we look at, at risk to business, risk of, of, um, uh, of operating the grid and so forth, um, one of the intersections that I find compelling on automation and transmission uh, space would be, we need to make sure everything is as it should be, right? So if, if a uh, transmission substation should be configured in a certain way, I need to know in real time, all the time that it's done. If a change is made uh, by a human you know, uh, going directly to site and to the to the platform and so forth. I need to know that. So some sort of overarching awareness 
is where I think the value of automation goes to. It isn't the speed, to your point. Yes, absolutely. No, and accuracy there is, is I mean, that's the mission critical network of all networks. It's, it is supporting the transmission grid where milliseconds matter and accuracy, I think, far exceeds speed of, of deployment and change to where, you know, um, you know, today there's, well, you have a SDN in the substation LAN is being discussed um, actively and, and available to where, you know, the true benefits of SDN would be an automated deployment, say, based on, you know, IEC 61850 model of the substation. That tells me all of the communications, all those settings files from relays tell me what's talking to what. And so I should have a model of what's talking to what that I could compare against the network. And the network should know when anything outside of those defined devices is trying to talk on the land. So from a security and segmentation standpoint, all of these kind of come together and you know, it'd be nice if I just throw my files in the controller and everything's provisioned, but I, d I don't know that we're quite to that point, but SDN and the substation land at first glance seems like, why, why would I add that level of complexity? But it does bring benefits, the same benefits it brings to a data center, it can bring to that substation land. Um, but there is a controller I'm adding and some components I'm adding to the network, which along with that change would bring possibly hesitation into you know, the transmission substation land's been working this way. Why Why would I go change it? And and so it, it is that kind of give and take of, you know, what what ultimately will drive those changes. And, and, and it may just be, I need more visibility into that land. What's going on internally? And there is, is a little bit of a, if it doesn't try to pass through a security device like a firewall, I don't really have visibility to what's behind the firewall unless the network itself is is more intelligent. Yeah, and you bring up a really good point about the an architecture like 61850, and I think what what I'm seeing is a uh, an adoption around the operating model you just mentioned, where 61850 is really prevalent. For example, in Europe, um, not quite as as bullish yet in the U.S., but definitely seeing the that notion that that you mentioned in areas where 61850 is is uh, almost the standard at this. Well, it is a standard, but the the de facto uh, architectural standard and, and architecture for a particular type of substation and so forth. So um, let's dive down to the bottom here, talk a little bit about um, reliability. I think we've made the case around, you know, network automation and, and human element and so forth. But I want to talk about cybersecurity here. Um, and, and let me make just a couple foundational comments and then throw it back to you on your thoughts of where, where just security in general is going. So, um, you know, I, I, I think I alluded to you know, there's ever increasing cybersecurity and so forth. But before we get to that, um, you know, I think sometimes cybersecurity and, and Dan, let me let me get your viewpoint on this. Sometimes cybersecurity sort of or has been, I think it's much less now, has been sort of put off to the side. Is there is this secure? It gets a stamp and you move on. I think I think more and more cybersecurity is 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 less of, uh, hey, did we do this? Um, it's more a, a main component of the stool of reliability. And as I alluded to before, this network, the OT network's reliability, is starting to get more and more correlated with the actual distribution of power as reliability. But where are you seeing in terms of, is cybersecurity being pulled into a, as a reliability component? Do you still feel it's being separate? What What's your view on, on that? that so if I, I guess looking at it from it security tied directly to reliability there has been and, and the industry has struggled throughout the years of i need hardened devices to go in harsh environments and having a sophisticated device that processes a lot of things that goes into that environment has been challenging like there you know it, it, some of our first projects dealing around what NERC SIP version three and getting, how do we even find a device that I, I trust to survive in that environment for very long reliably without actually increasing my operational expense to replace it all the time has been very challenging. And, and that's been a, um, that has been a, a, a challenge where if I can't trust the device, 
that is doing security, whatever it is, I have hindered reliability more than than anything else because the hardware has to survive no matter what. So it, historically, that has been a challenge. Better options are emerging, and the last few years have been much better about, well, I mean, as processing gets more and smaller and uses less power, that feeds into things that I can put in a, a, a substation where the air conditioner may fail in the middle of June like or July. And I have to keep running, and I, I'm not likely going to treat that HVAC as critical infrastructure. And if I can't get to it, that room's just going to be really hot, and I need all of my equipment to keep running because everything else in that room is designed that way. So I would say I, I want that picture to start coming together where you need cybersecurity to remain reliable. And I think we're, we're starting to move in that direction more versus, oh, the security device is one more thing that can get in my way. <laughs> you know, you bring, so, you bring up such a good point, you know, and it, it, it brings us back almost 10 years ago or maybe more where 6150 started driving this notion of, of passive cooling, right? Um, and okay, now that I have to be passively cooled, because that was essentially a, a reliability standard. Um, and, but by doing so, there's a lot of things I can't do that would have garnered reliability. For example, two control cards, right? Typically re require passive cooling. And so to your point, I think the, end the, the vendor industry has, has, has moved quickly or well, quickly at utility pace. Um, to try to bridge that gap, right? So from a Cisco standpoint, using the industrial switches as a security sensor and, and so on. So, um, you know, it, just to, to, to go back to, to cybersecurity and so forth on, on the transmission side, again, I would, I would offer the point that that is not getting less complex, what we're being asked to do. Um, and, uh, and I think we've, we've made the point Complexity with complexity comes risk, and one way to mitigate it is going to be with some type of automation. Uh, and I think that's where where I start start to see the marriage. Um, we're just coming up on the end of the time of our session, so I want to, you know, where are you seeing the rate of adoption? Right. So we talked about, you know, is distribution sort of leading the charge? Is transmission leading the charge? We we talked about the fact that there's two drivers, separate drivers for both of those, but yep. what, what do you think the state of automation is in, in the OT network right now? Uh, it, I, I, this, I mean, the state is, you know, the transmission side is doing what, what needs to be done to maintain business and reduce the O&M costs and automate the repeatable procedures because it doesn't have the same drivers as the field area networks do. I think the big driver for automation really will be the need to keep pace to keep, to keep pace with the distribution monetization deployment that communication has to support, those, are, those platforms are going to have to rely heavily on automation for provisioning, firmware updates, everything through the life cycle of that product. That management of those devices will have to be through the central interface, and it's not, it's not somebody getting and logging into 10,000 individual devices. That's completely unsustainable. So I really think the adoption of that will eventually move back into automating more in the transmission space as the as the value seen one place where it's necessary you're going to see more in the transmission space uh, over time to the you know pro automated provisioning and automated network changes based on change tickets or input parameters or what what have you that needs to be done i i think we're going to see it more uh, than we are today and where it's, I mean, automated firmware updates or pushing firmware, you know, not doing that manually, that's been in the transport system for quite a while. But I'd say the the ads and changes and removes of services, that's going to, that you're going to see more automation there as the, as the confidence is gained on the distribution side. Yeah, I think, I think we've seen the same thing, right? From a Cisco standpoint, we've had an automation engine per se on the fan for the better part of a decade. Uh, and some of what Marcus is going to talk about is, is, is bringing that even more sophisticated, but then now bringing it into the substation. So I think we've seen the same thing. You know, for us, it started in, in meters and meter collectors because that had, you know, significant volume. And now it's, it's being brought into to the substation. But you, you, you mentioned something that, 
it, it reminded me of something that happened years ago and sort of highlights this is we weren't uh, on the field area network, we weren't at the volumes that we are now, you know, that are now tens of thousands. We were in the hundreds or many of the hundreds. And uh, uh, a human driven firmware upgrade that doesn't go well um, when these assets are across several states and pushed out. Uh, you know, that's something I think we all want to avoid is having to send a bucket truck out to 150 sites because um, unfortunately it wasn't done right. So, um, but uh, that is the benefit of automation and, and what we're looking to, to hope avoid and to keep up with the pace of, of deployment, like you said, Dan. So, you know, Dan, uh, I'll be remiss. Let me quickly uh, stop sharing here. One of the great things I love working about working with Dan and his his crew here is this lab behind him. If, if folks haven't seen this, so Burns and Mac has this this lab that you might see some Cisco stuff off to the side, but uh, it's every yeah. vendor that you could possibly imagine, as well as all the substation components. So you can build the test teleprotection, test blizzard schemes across a field area network, across OPGW and so forth. So it's been a real asset, I think, to the industry. Uh, so just wanted to jump out of uh, presentation mode to share that with everyone. So Dan, I really want to thank you in sharing your insights, um, your viewpoints, Burns and Max viewpoints on, on where things are headed. And uh, appreciate it, Dan. And Marcus, we're, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shift over to you here. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. If I can get my mouse here. Oh, dear. Let's see. Pardon me. Oh, dear. Let's see. Oh, there we go. Okay. Sorry about that, Marcus. So as I alluded to earlier, Marcus leads up our uh, solution validation team, which is uh, Marcus is going to dive in and, and tell us all about here. Marcus, go ahead. Great. Thanks, guys. So, yeah, just just nice segue into the Cisco validated design. So for those of you that don't know, there's quite a large team at Cisco that focuses on building these uh, solutions. So with the Cisco IoT product portfolio, but also the wider Cisco products as well. So be that enterprise security uh, and a lot of the other products and uh, hardware and software we have at Cisco. So the CVDs really are there to provide you with end-to-end -end validated architectures that we've tested, uh, give you the best practices, best practices from Cisco's point of view, as well as what we learn from customers. And, and we get a lot of input from customers. And then finally, comprehensiveness. You know, like I said, we test a lot of the Cisco portfolio, not just the hardened uh, IoT products. And we also test a lot of different third party products as well, where they're relevant to the solutions. Next slide, Jeff. Sorry, Marcus, I'm, uh, I'm trying. There we go. Sorry. Yeah. So this is just a summary. There's, there's Cisco validated designs for most verticals uh, that we're involved in. Obviously, utilities and renewables, we've got quite a few CVDs now available on our external website, and we're briefly going to quickly look at substation automation and distribution automation. So next slide. Okay, so substation automation, we've recently refreshed this CVD, and these are the new parts, really, that we focused on. So the new products at the bottom, so the new switching and routing products, and we'll briefly mention the IR8300 shortly. And really what we're focusing on today are the software, the automation capabilities. So on the right, we've added the Cisco SD-WAN capability for managing the uh, Cisco IR8300 as a, a substation router, so a substation gateway managed by SD-WAN. And on the left-hand side, we've got our Cisco DNA Center platform. So this is where we want to actually manage, uh, provision uh, the switches as well as the routing platforms in the substation as well. Okay, so moving on to the, this is a quick look at the architecture, switching and routing in the substation. For those of you interested, we test a lot of different IEC 61850 architectures as well as more traditional architectures. But in red, you can see management and automation being called out. That's really the key topic here is how we can move away from those manually configured, CLI configured uh, deployments that, that we've historically seen. 
Next slide. Okay, so just a quick overview of DNA Center for those of you not familiar. It's an automation platform, well, it's a management and automation platform, but really here we're leaning on the automation capabilities, the abilities for us to discover and onboard uh, switches and routers in the substation and provision the configuration to those devices, doing software upgrades, uh, being able to view our network inventory as well as our network topology. And at the bottom, we've mentioned compliance. So checking we got the right firmware on devices uh, and also checking the, uh, the security vulnerabilities that are available from Cisco on these particular products. So you can get them in, get it in one place. And then from an assurance point of view, we're really taking uh, the monitoring capabilities. We're looking at the health of the network, the devices, uh, troubleshooting tools, as well as gu guided remediation to help you replace devices in the network when they're faulty. So there's a lot of good functionality there. And these are some of the key aspects that we targeted in the uh, CVD. Yeah, Marcus, I'd call out what we're looking at here just broadly is, is the full capability. And what your team has done sort of its first iteration is pull out what you've highlighted in red here, the, the items that are most often requested to be leveraged in the OT environment and then subsequent iterations of your validated designs, in this case, specifically to the substation, we'll start adding more of these blocks in over time. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. It, it's right. an evolution, it's a journey. It's a, and the CVD will evolve as we, these customers adopt these technologies and we get more, uh, com we see more complex use cases. You know, there's something we haven't touched on real quick and this is notion of extended enterprise, right? So this is, this is, you know, um, in, in, in an engine, a, a a software engine that would be leveraged on the largest enterprise networks and this capability is now uh, from a Cisco standpoint being pulled into the OT side. So certainly yep. we see you, the earliest adopters are the utilities that already have DNAC on the enterprise side. They've proven out its value, they recognize its value, um, its impact on reliability and so forth and they want to extend that, that method of operations in the OT side. I think those are the ones that have early pressed us to say you know, on those red boxes, you know, we Absolutely. want this, this component. So uh, continue if you wouldn't, fine. Yeah, and then the other technology that, that we've been talking about is SD-WAN. So a way to automate the provisioning and the management of the WAN. So most utilities are deploying large uh, IP networks across the WAN, IP MPLS, cellular, running IPsec over the top. And SD-WAN really basically offers you a really good way to automate the provisioning uh, of that and then add VPNs on top, do the security, push security policies down. So we're starting to see SD-WAN being adopted now by more and more utilities. And we have uh, recently been validating a number of Cisco industrial routers with the SD-WAN solution, and we're about shortly to release uh, an SD-WAN set of CVDs specifically for distribution automation use cases. So they should be available on our external website in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, and this this hammers the same point home. So this is distribution automation. Sorry. And, Sorry. Yeah. So. This is a quick look at a particular scenario. So a Cisco industrial router, IR1101, uh, SD-WAN managed and connecting to recloser in the field. So we're able to provision the IR1101 and do the ongoing management, firmware upgrades, et cetera, of that particular platform. We could, we've also validated both ethernet and serial use cases, okay, running across the SD-WAN overlay network. And this is a slightly different example of a secondary substation, uh, probably more common in, in Europe, uh, but where we have a slightly larger distribution substation with potentially more devices. S same solution, IR1101 and SD-WAN overlay. And then from a security point of view, we can manage the security policies centrally and push those out to the devices at the edge of the network. So we don't have to be configuring uh, manually configuring access control lists, for example, or zone-based firewalls at the edge of the network. We can do it centrally and we can do it per 
VPN as well. So we can have different policies per VPN on the SD-WAN fabric. Next slide. Yeah, so we've got lots of products which are geared towards utilities, lots of hardened IoT products specifically built for utilities. And we have CVDs and solution CVDs that are available on our external website. Uh, the CVDs really will take the IoT products and also the wider Cisco products and turn them into solutions that customers can, can actually deploy. And then finally, we're currently running a promotion on our, on our relatively new IR8340 platform uh, designed for the substation. It's got a lot of great features switching and routing in one box, synchronization module, edge compute, cellular support, PoE. I mean, it's, it's an amazing box with a lot of functionality. And we're running a, a discount promotion at the moment on, on that particular box until September. So it's an opportunity if you're looking at refreshing the WAN capability in your substation, uh, the 8340 is, is, a, is a pretty amazing platform to do that. And it's SD-WAN capable as well. So we are in the process of validating this box as part of our SD-WAN solution for IP and serial-based use cases as well. Perfect. Well, thanks, Marcus. Thanks for walking us through at a very, very high level uh, on the validated designs. They can be found on the web. Uh, as you can imagine, there's a, a significant amount of detail that goes into it, as well as uh, not just Cisco, how to configure uh, timing in a, on the substation bus, but uh, you know, what are the what are the protocol requirements for, you know, a variety of different utility specific use cases and so forth. So um, I wanted to I wanted to just take a moment, to thank Marcus and, and Dan for for jumping on and sharing their insights, the work they've been doing. I did want to uh, just close this with uh, things that are coming up. So Cisco Live or user group is coming up June 4th through 8th. Uh, where you can get together with you and 20,000 of your closest uh, friends uh, out in Vegas. There's also going to be a Utility Summit breakout there. So if you're interested, reach out to your Cisco uh, sales team and they'll help you navigate that process. Cisco and Burns McDonald are doing three trainings across the U.S. coming in the fall. Uh, that'll incorporate um, some of Dan's teams uh, talking about things like, uh, you know, where is NERCSIP compliance? What's the intersection of that and network design? Uh, what are substation networks looking like, as well as uh, some hands-on lab work? And then, of course, as, as Marcus mentioned, the 8340 uh, promotion that will be going on till, uh, up until the fall. So with that, I want to thank everyone so much for giving us uh, an hour of their time today and, and talking about uh, network automation. Uh, in the OT space, I think what we've left you with is is things are moving in that direction, and so we wanted to just bring some awareness into the industry, uh, as well as just touch briefly upon the, the capabilities that, that Cisco has. So thanks again for Dan, Marcus, and everyone else for joining. Have a great rest of your day.